Thank you for coming. My name is Jim Moran, and I am the uh, master printer at Hamilton. And the program's co-producer, Stephanie Carpenter, is uh, also here. Um, she's also the programming manager as well. But um, uh, thank you all for coming. <clears throat> Thanks especially to our guest, H.R. Bischler, for agreeing to be on the air. <clears throat> so. Um, this is the last of four uh, programs that we've done regarding a grant that the museum received from the Wisconsin Humanities Council. And I need to read it just to be official here. Cultural community engagement is technically the, um, the name of the grant, but it did allow us to re-examine our collection and think about those things that are in it from uh, newer standpoints. And so um, Stephanie was kind enough to uh, put that into the chat so you can take a look at the particulars there. But um, the uh, four topics were shared by uh, Ben Blount, who spoke on Wednesday, uh, Kelly Walters, which was about a month ago, and then Rick Griffith. And these are all on the website so that you can look at these. And <clears throat> excuse me, because we are be, being recorded today, uh, you'll be able to look back at HRs. We often find that not everybody can stay on for the whole thing. So you can always go back and, and look at it and um, uh, point out the things we could have done better, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so one thing that we'd like to bring up is a land acknowledgement. And I think about the fact that um, some years ago when we were still in the original building, there was a member of the uh, Menominee tribe that came to the museum and indicated that where the East and West Twin Rivers meet um, was often a meeting ground for five tribes that would meet every summer basically to uh, get together and um, either uh, fish or simply you know, celebrate. Um, those tribes uh, were the Menominee and the Ojibwe and the Dakota, uh, the Ho-Chunk and the Potawatomi. So that is the land that we are on and, and we always like to make reference to that before we get going. Um, as I said before, our guest today H.R. Bischler, uh, now from Chicago, um, is uh, going to give us uh, her particular uh, piece of the, of the grant. And animal exploitation was the topic that she took on. So welcome, H.R. I am turning it over to you. Okie dokie. Hi. I'm going to pull my slideshow right away just because all my business is there. So give me a second. Also, hello. Thank you for coming and listening to me ramble. Always a pleasure. All right, we good? Good? Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, so I'm pretty sure, well, I, I am sure. For this presentation, I'm probably just going to walk you through the three weeks relatively sequentially and get the process of doing the piece. Um, hopefully that'll be of interest and I'll touch a little bit on conceptualizing. I just think that um, I don't like to dwell on that too much. I like to give people their own area to fill that in. Um, to start, I will say that when Jim reached out for this and told me I'd been assigned animal exploitation, I was immediately uncomfortable and definitely unsure as to whether or not I'd be a good fit. And I think um, right before we had confirmed dates, I gave him an out, kind of be like, yeah, I mean, if you don't really want me to do this, it's okay. Um, clearly, he did not take the out. And ultimately, you know, I'm in the habit of trying new things. And something makes you uncomfortable, so you probably should do it. Um, so I was limited to working with the circus collection and the Inquirer. So that was going to be what I pulled from and kind of go from there. I'm lucky enough to say that it hasn't been my first rodeo at Hamilton, and that is a pun. 
and I've spent a good deal of time working with them, um, particularly with the acquisition and processing of the Globe collection. And there was a little bit of time when I actually organized the part of the Inquirer that I ended up working with. Um, and I actually think the Inquirer wasn't that in like process when I was working on Globe. I feel like you were talking about semi loads at some point. It Maybe. it was quite early. You're right. I think so right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's neither here nor there. Um, so I'm pretty lucky to get to come back and actually work with it, and particularly some giant eight sheet blocks. So the charge nature of this topic weighed pretty heavy. Like I felt kind of like it necessitated this directness that isn't really always present in my practice. Um, I remember looking at the sample images from the circus collection that Jim had sent along and um, I didn't really, I didn't know what the heck I was going to do with them. I think there, I mean, I'm a little bit thankful that when I was an undergraduate working in print media and philosophy and food and culture, mouthful, my primary subject matter was around the history of meat in American culture and um, mortality, good stuff like that. It was the School of the Art Institute. Anyways, um, so there was a period of my life where I was looking at artists um, like Suko, who really intentionally, if you're not familiar with her, she is heavily involved in anti-cruelty activism, and her work can be pretty graphic and guttural. Um, my work did not turn out that way, because I don't work that way. But I did have a little bit of a bias and some kind of philosophical position 20 years ago. That is. So I knew I'd be considering exploitation broadly which would give me a lot of freedom to move around the collection with pretty low stakes. It's really common for me to start out kind of like this way where I look at a word and I build off that word and it's degrees of meaning through either etymology or just different definitions over the years, um, how it's been used culturally and how that's changed. Um, and I start to kind of carve out a path with language. Um, it doesn't always look like this. It's usually pretty temporal, but this is what it looks like if I try to formalize it. So just so you get the idea. And I kind of tried to bold in some keywords. The other thing that I thought I knew when I was coming in was that it would be small. So I think this is actually the glow collection over here, right? Yes, I think so. Um, and I thought that I could be reasonable for once in my life and do something that takes up little space. And one condition of my residency was also that this charming dog who looks very disinterested in everything comes along with me. Um, so I was looking for absences, I don't know, taking notes, trying to find something that felt right. It really wasn't working out. So then I figured, why not just stroll about these ridiculously large multi-sheet poster blocks that are hanging out over here? I remember those, those are fun, they look good. Just take a break. Um, and then I found the polar bear, um, which actually is really exciting. So I was taken by the polar bear. And this image over here is not a proof from the museum, but it's basically gonna, it's basically the same bear that you see right here. Um, and I'm sure most of you probably are familiar with the fact that a lot of these blocks are produced in such a way that they can be either sent out to different cities or places, but mostly there's these knockouts, so then they can just have their name printed on them and dates and all that business. This poster, poster um, is a six block, is it six block? It's a six block, eight sheet, no, it would be an eight block, eight sheet, I don't know, I can't remember. It's a lot of sheets and a lot of blocks that makes the final billboard. Um, and that's what I decided to work with. There's also a red key that's not here because that was gonna be the text that I had absolutely no interest in. So I wandered over to Jim's desk and asked him of the statute of limitations on what material I could work with because it was big. Um, thankfully, Jim Sheradden was there who was a huge help my first week and helped me pull the bear off the rack amongst other things. So my thought was that I was gonna run the two colors so that's going to be 10 blocks to pull and make one set. Hang on. Go back. Okay. 
um, right, 10 blocks to pull and make one full set. That's going to be a complete full board. And the yellow was six blocks because the positive for the sky was printed separate from the line work. Um, took a day probably to clean and oil the fronts and backs. So then they were kind of refreshed and good to go. Originally, I thought I was going to be pulling one for the archive. So we started off by printing the yellow blocks. Um, this does two things. One, it, no, yeah. One, it refreshes the block. And two, it kind of gives a chance for the block to get a new protective barrier for whatever color I am going to lay down. Um, so this is, this is what Jim and I did for Adam, that is. Um, but he taught me a few things about handling these larger blocks because I'd worked with older blocks that had hairline fractures and warp, but these are of obviously a totally different scale. It's different than an 18 by 18 inch piece. Um, I also didn't know that you could ink them to death. I'd have been inking for an eternity with the coverage that I was dishing out because I'm pretty modest. Also, side note, Jim and S got along swimmingly. She was never as happy as she was that first week. So you'll note that we're also pulling one sheet here. That changes in week two. Um, but this was week one. We printed a bunch of yellow, yellow, yellow blocks proofs. Um, I walked away understanding how long roughly it took to prep, pull, and clean one block on its own. And I had a good consistent lockup for how I'd proceed. So it's useful. Definitely important stuff. Um, and then the main focus for week two was going to be ideally pulling two solid proofs and three solid prints from each black key block that would make five final sets, which now were eight sheets per set because I cha we changed the stock to something that was much lighter and coated, which works a whole lot better. Um, there's four extra sheets because I added a pop to the negative space. So since I needed a full bear for whatever I was doing, just getting that done was enough to fill up week two. And that's a lot of ink that has to dry before I can lay it out and do anything with it. So while it dried or I waited for help between pulls, um, I started to do that thing where you do research, which is I dug around the internet. I pulled up some books that were not with me, but they lived on my Google Drive and started looking into polar bears at the circus. So these are just you know, for historical purposes, this is Doris Arndt and Ursula Boucher. Um, They were two well-known female, um, I don't know what you call them, circus trainers, who, you know, it's a big deal because actually it was a male-dominated field. One is German, one is American. Apparently, Boucher is actually known for having humane training methods, and I don't know much about Arndt. And I also haven't looked into whether or not that's true about Butcher. I don't know what they consider humane. But then there's this. Um, so that kind of goes with what I'm looking at. And I started to get really interested in this case that I had remembered about um, from this group or team that was working in Moscow. And mostly the mindset of the one trainer, I remember that they had said that she trained the instinct out of them while they were young. Um, and this is contemporary. This is probably in the last 10 years. And I mean, we know that the training measures traditionally used were and are beyond aversive. They seem severe to the point that the animals who were often young didn't even make it through those trainings themselves. They would just die. Um, it's horrific. It's criminal. And I get incredibly ill thinking about it in the slightest, but it's not a new practice, which is evident by this material, and it's also not been eradicated, to say the least. But the bear I'm printing is the bears you see here and here. And I think this one is beautifully tragic in its own right. And the photographer did it for National Geographic, and I'm pretty sure she won some awards. Um, but I'm going to go back to these two images, which it's just primarily because the muzzles, the main thing that I'm pulling from, 
and I got pretty fixated on it. And I think the fact that they aren't docile expressions at all were important. Um, and just throughout looking at all of the training procedures, I kind of started thinking about the idea of dehumanizing and humanizing, which I noted back in that giant text block in the beginning, and how they relate and they don't relate. So one of the latter entries from the Oxford English Dictionary for humanizing actually is to adapt for human use, which feels a little bit unexpected because the concept of adapting anything for our use, specifically a living being, a sentient being for that matter, feels very um, in opposition to humanizing as I think we commonly might conjure it. Um, so I had this tension between if by humanizing we're dehumanizing or the other way around. But that's just kind of so you know what I'm thinking. I don't know if it really comes through. So let's come back to our polar bear. Also, hey, this is our big polar bear and he's done. A um, little tilted because that's the best I could do from the ladder. Um, for brevity, I would like to say I got very upset with the polar bear and I expressed this to Jim many times because the bear looks so happy. He looks so totally cool to be here. He looks like he feels fine, He's chilling on his iceberg. He doesn't know what's about to happen to that. That's fine. It's okay. And I really just didn't want him to be happy because I just knew he wasn't happy. And we all know it's very hard to appear happy when we're not. So. I mean, that's the thing, right? So in all of these posters, we're seeing an animal that's complicit, who's tamed, who's calm, except for the exception of posters that are meant to so, show how violent these animals are and that they've been tamed. And isn't that wonderful and a spectacle? But either way, they've been removed from a natural environment and displaced. So it's pretty, pretty unlikely that he was content with being displaced. So kind of this unhappiness, stripping of value, muzzle, violence were things that I took into account when I was designing the piece, which obviously I had to bring in to digital design. Um, and I tried really hard to make that bear not seem so happy and um, communicate the violence and the eradication of joy. And I mean, even this mock-up I think felt pretty soft for me that I kind of hoped it would fix itself on the press. Um, and then there's that text, because I like the words, um, which are brought to you by our dear old friend Nietzsche for some quality redaction. And the quote, if you're interested, is from his whole idea of the will to power, which makes regular appearances in the young good and evil. Um, I don't have a lot of energy to flush it out because it's complicated and there's conflicting um, interpretations of what he's trying to say. But in all of those interpretations, it ultimately is problematic. Um, so it was right for redaction. And with this particular excerpt, I just basically am resting on how he looks at exploitation as intrinsic to our being as necessary as a basic organic function. And I picked it because I'm pulling out the use of the words exploitation, this idea of capital T power, um, organic or of nature and life and kind of went from there. And I'm not, that's, that's about all I'm gonna give you on that. Uh, so we went from digital mock-up to full print and there are a lot more marked up digital mock-ups than ones with the text, but those also are at the museum and they're very colorful. I miss them. They would have given me some use for this presentation. But ultimately it's scaled up. It's 10 times the scale. So it's 10 times smaller on the digital print. Um, but I mean, it's it's just a giant lot of, so you're gonna go, to, go through the same process, right? You're gonna set it up, shift things up as you go and make sure in this case that nothing, all your spacing is gonna fall nicely on the splits between what I had made two sets or set for each block. So that's how my text blocks were kind of lined up and shifting. Um, and you start with character count. So decide which of that, those sets has the most amount of characters on it. Make sure you have all those accounted for. And once you're sure about that, you go and fill out everybody else. So all over the globe collection, I had all these little red cards 
that I hunted down later so I could put this back. Um, right. And then you print enough groups of every single character so you can lay all that out because it's not the same as a digital mockup anymore and start figuring it out so you can build the rest of your lockup. So thanks, Steph, for all these photos. Um, so everything gets adjusted. This actually is where I'm laying out the last bit of text, so the red text. Everything else has been printed at this point. And this is just a lockup. And this would be just a note for me when I come back to the museum of how things are going to be registered. So that's actually, I think that's week three. I don't know. Yes, week three was going to be proofing and printing type. So we already did week two. And that's when I'm tired. My dog's tired. We're all very tired. Um, so it's the home stretch. So this is where we're at at midpoint in week three, which is my last week. And the red had actually just been printed. I just had to work with it wet. So the next task for me was um, printing up those big red stripes and doing all the strike throughs on the text, which I didn't have a lot of time to throw anything back on press. Um, and that means the way I did it was going to be hand braiding. So it's the same thing where I just measured out the weight of my lines. I made sort of a connect the dots and masked everything out. So this whole red stripe was masked and it was laying over a giant piece of plate glass, which is right here, this is this very heavy piece of glass that we just kind of shifted up as I went. This is a little bit of my trail of garbage, which is as I went, I just had to throw aside a mask and hope that I didn't get ink anywhere else. And towards the end, I kind of started to bust things up a bit because the ink got really tacky. But only the red stripes and the sort of muzzling had to be masked out. Everything else in terms of the strike through, I thought it would be better if it was just kind of a freehand sort of thing. Um, but this is literally at the end of the residency. So this is the last day and at the end, um, Steph and Jim were kindly waiting for me to finish and pack everything up. Steph took my dog out. It was very kind of her, um, but I was very tired and a little worried because I barely got the proof done. This is just one, so I technically have four left, but that's it. This very large thing on a very tiny screen that makes it feel very distant and you kind of lose something because this thing is taller than me. Um, it's it's a billboard, but overall, I think I'm happy with how it works out. I think that the more gestural element of the hand braiding for the strike through kind of better conveys a little bit of violence, you know, it's a defacement. Um, and I hope one day to see it upright in person and not on the floor. But, you know, I don't know. And also, I think I think she's a little less happy. I think so. He could be unhappier. That's, that's the gist of it. Thank you. And here's an exhausted dog. Just go back to that. You know, uh, one of the things uh, that I love about this so much is that, um, you go back to the the poster that you found of the polar bear, and I, I made a note that it is the same artwork. It looks as though it mm -hmm. is clearly color number two as opposed to um, the key line. But, um, you know, it, it's a beautiful carving and it's a great bear, and then you kind of trash it. And um that was so appropriate so when you were just talking about the more gestural marks through the text it it makes complete sense to me because um we don't get to see the beauty of it right we get we get to see uh, a distressed version and 
I thought that's where you accomplished things in such a wonderful way. Thank you. A successful one. <clears throat> there, um, what also is interesting is you taught us a lot about the arrangement of such large pieces. We have them, but we, I was gonna say, we don't do too many billboards. Actually, we don't do any billboards really. So you, you win that distinction of having printed the first billboard at Hamilton. And since those blocks are 40 by 52, that's a 12 sheeter. So, you know, if, you, if you're that's gonna brag, you know, bump it up, right? Um, so, um we are hoping to exhibit uh everybody's work but hr and i were talking uh before the show about uh how to mount it and so the hope is that we can get it up i uh i think it will be quite dynamic because at 12 by 10 feet roughly it's a massive piece so um, but I suppose I should quit uh, talking for at least a moment to let anybody else ask questions if they have them. <clears throat> now, uh, our first question is what it was like to work so large and would you like to work on that scale again? Oh. I work on that scale. I'm pretty, that's why I want to do something small. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, I like the challenge of printing large, but it's also, I mean, in terms of engaging your body in those sorts of things, it's a lot more, there's an elegance to it that makes it, makes whatever stress it's giving you a lot more peaceful. Um, there's also a lot of billboards back there, you know, they need some love. Well, uh, that said, it isn't the first time you worked on a grand scale at Hamilton. There is a contraption in the back uh, so that you can print off of rolls of paper. What what was that project, HR? Uh, that was for my wires and weights work at Wells College. Right, right. <clears throat> Um, now, Meredith had a question. Oh, she wondered if if um, this would be a good one for a future Waze Goose, which I think it certainly That's would. That's not on me. Um, however, I do like the idea of you and the other uh, individuals from the grant uh, talking about the various projects. I think one of uh, one of the first things that I noted when you were choosing your direction is that, oh, I wouldn't have done it that way, which is actually perfect because that's the whole point is you come in with a unique perspective and uh, it is quite different than, um, you know, the reproduction of some of those posters. How would you have done it, Jim? That's what I want to know. Well, I uh, I was kind of curious about this guy named Wallace, who, when you show one of your first slides, there is the club raised in the air. That guy was an animal tamer and became a circus owner. And I guess one of the things that occurs to me is, um, who grows up wanting to beat the hell out of animals that way? Um, he held a record for coercing something like 40 some lions and tigers all onto small stools at the same time. And so I guess it's, um, you know, I'm just sort of curious about the mindset, I guess, but you know, I, uh, um, I just like the fact that uh, you did something that I had not imagined and and it worked well. Um, so what was the worst of trying to assemble that many pieces? 
the worst like technical part of that. Yep. Um, you make one error on one piece, throws the whole thing off. And I think the one that we have is because it was a proof. I was like, I'm putting together the proof on the floor. We'll do like three more of these before I leave. I think that one was the one where I had forgot to bump. I either forgot to bump in or bump out the margin on that set for the column. And um, it messed up how everything was lining up when I went to lay it out. And I went, thankfully I caught it and then the other four are fine, but we had to do some weird mix and matching to move something else under and trim off all the edges to make sure it would at least work for the proof. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's the big challenge. I think when you're printing that large is everything has to line up, especially because i my assumption is they weren't running two sheets on one block. They were probably at least doing one full sheet for each of those blocks. So you have that going, going for you where you have to lay down that second sheet, which you helped me with to make sure everything lines up. And then you have to hope that you're making the same adjustments each time you put a new block on the press, which there's some natural wiggle room there, but at that scale, there's nothing you're gonna notice unless you forgot to move an entire margin in by like four inches. Mm -hmm. Did you um, did you have any other thoughts or, or just uh, think about any other ideas on what you would do with that collection? I'd have to take a look at it. I only went as far as that polar bear and then I was out and away. <clears throat> Well, you did grab about the biggest thing that you could. So kudos for that. Yeah. I might rethink that in the future. Well, it, it's the framing that causes issues for me, but that that's we can solve that. It's it's a billboard. Does it really need to be framed, you know? Uh no. UV though, light. I know there's UV light. Well, I like the idea, you know, one of the things that I think you did, which any of us who work on the big block sees is the wrong perception of how big images are viewed. You know, we're a foot away looking at details that bother us, whereas the viewer is always, you know, eight, 10, 50 or more feet away. And mm -hmm. so, um, they're they're carved that way too but uh, the idea that we could at least put that up to be viewed uh from a distance would be great i think it it overwhelms you in a really nice way yes jim is this going to fit in our new gallery space <laughs> is this the test <clears throat> it will not um but um, what I do note is that uh, for those of you who have been to uh, Hamilton Ways Goose, there are these huge red doors uh, that became the backdrop for the podium. And they are taller than HR's piece, which means that that entire wall is usable as new gallery space. So the, the yet undeveloped gallery wall, it will fit on. So we got that going for us. Um, HR, uh, Mark Smith um, um, sort of taking off on this idea of the perception of the piece is that you'd have to take into mind uh, the speed that you might be going by a poster, meaning you know what will catch your eye. What do you think about that? In terms of if you're driving by that one? Yeah, uh, yeah or, or just, you know, what, what they might have been looking to do if you were only getting those few seconds. I mean, they're wanting to get your attention on the animal. Because that's, that's the attraction. So everything else is just 
that's filler. I mean, you get you get the animal or you get the the tamer with the ring of animals, whatever else you know you've got on there. And then if you care, you come back and you figure out whose circus is it, where is it, when is it. <clears throat> so, not the details are going to get you. Yeah, yeah. Like how many of those animals died before the one that is in the cage actually could be trained. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody knows about that. Uh, it is interesting that uh, that we've finally seen the ending of, at least in this country, uh, using wild animals as showpieces in small cages or large cages. Um, it, it also uh, signaled the end for a number of printers who specialized in that kind of work. That's the way it goes. Um, it's, uh, it's a subject matter that I'm sure they weren't thinking too much about in terms of what they were reprinting. And that's sort of the nature of the, the grant idea. You know, let's think about what the heck are you looking at here? Hans, you have your hand up, and since you already said hello, I assume there's a question behind that. <laughs> yeah, um, HR, fantastic work, and I'm blown away by the expressiveness of the, uh, the piece. I was wondering if during your research, uh, you found out where this torture continues. There's, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of it still in Russia. Um, there's a group that keeps tabs on different circuses amongst other uh, places. I'd have to find the link somewhere, but it'll like track down what measures have been taken since they've been accused of animal cruelty or what have you, whether or not when the last time is they've been reported on or who's checked in to see if that those changes have been implemented um but most of it is eastern europe PETA doesn't have much effect over there i imagine they try i i mean they did have a large effect on the american circus companies um it it's unfortunate that so many of those uh, circuses seem to feel that they could not exist without wild animals. You know, I mean, if that's the biggest draw that you've got, um, maybe maybe the idea has flaws, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. There's there's zoos too. You can throw them into some mm -hmm. problematic things, but. I don't know. I didn't think about putting together a list of resources for anyone who might be interested in looking into it. We we can leave that for another project. HR, I have a follow up if you, if, you, if I can. Sure. Um, to what extent uh, did the creative portion of this process happen? Um, on the with the physical print. In other words, when you were coming up with ideas for how to uh, manipulate the image, um, did you do a lot of work on the floor or were you doing most of it in your computer? Most of it was in the computer. I couldn't work on the floor. I mean, that was just the, that was just the nature of that scale. But I couldn't figure anything else else out until I'd actually printed the whole bear because I also didn't, I mean, I didn't know how friendly he was, for lack of better words. Um, but everything else was definitely on the computer. It was just figuring out how to get it to work on the floor. And then the, the, there were the smaller, <clears throat> excuse me, the decisions to just hand brayer or things like that, that came up, but I am admittedly someone who plans quite a bit. 
to life. Once I've got it, once I have it figured out. I have a question that might add to that. You proofed the yellow and then in the end, it looks like you used the key block. And was that just part of the process, like figuring out what was, because it's a big print to wrap your head around. Is that part of that process, figuring out what you were going to use or? Yeah, there wasn't any, there wasn't any need for the yellow or adding a second color. Because really, I just needed that key block because that's the focus point. And then I needed to work from there. And also logistics. There was no way, absolutely no way I was going to print that. Even though Jim kept saying, we just need one. And I was like, we don't need one. It's impossible. There are times when we are uh, working with the blocks. And of course, so many of them have never been printed by us. Um, that there's a certain integrity to the color of a block. And, and before we alter the color, uh, sometimes I like to try and recreate the color as it is, if only for proofing purposes. And so a lot of the yellow was kind of based on that thinking uh, that we didn't want to uh, uh, change it too much before we knew for certain. So uh, then, we realized that was too damn much work to try and do the whole thing. And it was best abandoned, um, partly because the way HR was approaching it wasn't going to, uh, wasn't going to be a, a problem at all. And she'd need another three weeks if we were gonna do that as a two color piece, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. And I don't think in the end, really, it would have been affected the way it was designed if there was another color in there. No, I think it's got a lot of drama as is. <clears throat> um, Mark asked the question, was everything to scale on the computer to the finished piece? Best I could, yeah. It was 10 times. everything, even the text weight, unless I ran out <laughs> off of it. But yeah, it was, it was to scale. I think maybe, was it a little more squat? No, no, it wasn't. What are the final dimensions? What are they? I don't remember. Uh, I th Six, think- 16? Uh, it seems to me that by it, 20? what's that? No, it's not 16 by 20. It, it is about uh, 12 by 10. Uh, probably, yeah, it, it, it is uh, about 12 by 10. Really big was Steph's calculation, which is actually ac right. really accurate. Uh, but do you mind if I make a, a little bit of a jump here and just ask you about your uh, letterpress printing background? You know, where does it where does it start? Um, it starts at a time far, far away um, in undergrad with. Oh, I forgot her name now, um, but. I took letterpress through the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, who at the time was contracted out with Columbia College. So okay. that's where it starts. Oh, Kathy uh, Ruggie Saunders. Kathy, Kathy Ruggie Saunders. Yes, uh -huh. there you are. So I took a couple classes with her. I don't think she knew what she was doing with me at some point. Um, she always said my work turned out well. She just didn't know what I was doing. And then yeah, I just kept doing it from there in some way or another. Um, well, then what took you to Madison? Was that for grad school? No, I just moved to Madison. I'm from Wisconsin. Um, and apparently Madison seemed like a good idea. 
I'm, that's it. That's the reasoning. It seemed like a good idea. I couldn't find a job in Chicago at that point. I was tired of the job that I did have, which was silk screening. Thermal colored shirts. It was fun. It was awful. Um, but yeah, I just moved to Madison. Uh, did you intern at Silver Buckle? No. Um, I went to Silver Buckle to meet Tracy to inquire about starting a print cooperative. Um, Tracy kindly entertained and helped get the ball rolling on that. I don't think it would have gotten the traction it did and then started up a print cooperative. She also was very helpful in getting a lot of the early equipment. They're still there. It's Polka Press. They're still going. They're going strong. I think they've even got a Riso. Should check them out. Highly recommend. And then from there, I went to graduate school at Columbia College in the now late uh, book and paper program. Mm -hmm. Are we done? Do you need me to keep going? This is this has been really great. It was nice of you to take the time to uh, to sit with us today. It's been uh, it mostly fun to work with you and to watch you work. That that is where the funnest part is, I think. And I do appreciate you taking on the uh, the task because it has an overwhelming quality to it. So, um, uh, but it worked. You know, and and I I'm very grateful for the work you did here. I mean, I'm grateful to get to do it. I'm lucky. I get to hang out at that museum. It's it's fun. Well, and you can Except bring for the skylights. Hot. And yes, I can bring my dog, which is it's wonderful to have a shop dog, even if she comes out of there looking a totally different color. Well, um, I, I think that uh, there are just a few uh, announcements sort of things that um, I will ask Steph if she will, will bring up because, uh, well, that's what we do, you know. I will do that. Okay. I um, want to say thank you, everybody. Thank you, HR. Um, same thing I told Ben is it was really lovely to hear your process because even though I was around to see you work, it's not like I can read mine. So knowing no, more about what you're doing and why you did it um, was so wonderful. So thank you for presenting today. You're welcome. Um, let's see, I am gonna put some things over into the chat uh, because, and I do wanna say, I'm sorry, the museum's making weird noises today. It's so happy to see you that it can't contain its joy. So uh, you're here in some, I don't know, heat or something. Uh, so I do want to say you might have noticed this is the last ham hang for a little bit. Um, we're getting new dates on the calendar, um, so do keep an eye out for that. Uh, we do have one upcoming uh, virtual workshop, so you can sign up for Heather Mulder. She's down at Hatch Showprint, and uh, she is going to teach people how to do Sintra board, um, which is a really nice different method that you can use or different substrate that you can use for relief printing. So if you really like wood carving or if you really like lino carving, um, Sintra is a really nice uh, different material to use. And this is the second time she's taught that workshop. Saw the first one, it was wonderful. She's a great teacher. She has cameras in all the right places. Um, so I recommend getting signed up because that workshop is starting to film more. Uh, and then also, so then um, the other thing is be on the lookout. We'll have new uh, in-person online workshops and then we'll have more Hamilton hangs. Um, one way to find out about all of those is to become a member. Uh, Hamilton is a nonprofit and your support definitely makes these things possible. And it means you hear about it first because we send out emails to our members um, with information when things are happening. And two things that are happening this year that are really exciting is it's a two ways goose year. So we have the normal Hamilton ways goose we are hoping, we are planning, plotting, we are planning for November 4th through 6th for that to be in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. Uh, get your hotel rooms now. And that's November 4th through 6th at Hamilton. 
I cannot tell you who, but we have our keynotes. Bum, bum, bum. So um, that is great because that allows us to plan the rest of our speakers. So we are hard at work behind the scenes, getting all of that plan, uh, put together. And then also we do not normally have the Amalgamated Printers Association Ways Goose at Hamilton because they're, they're Ways Goose Travels. But this year it is in Two Rivers. So June 9th through 12th, we are having the Amalgamated Printers Association Ways Goose at Hamilton. Um, the wonderful thing is that there are different presentations and different speakers. So you could come to Hamilton twice for two ways gooses this year. Um, and so I've put that information on the side. Uh, neither one of those have signups yet, but we are working on both of them. Uh, our ways goose registration normally happens in July, and we are working with the Amalgamated Printers Association to get their registration open. I don't have a date for that yet, so stay tuned. Thanks, and Jim. We don't, or not we, I don't have to, you don't have to, uh, be a member of APA to join that particular Ways Goose, which is a little different than some of their prior ones. Yes, they have um, the fun thing, um, they have great, we're going to do workshops with them, we're going to do demonstrations with them. Uh, we'll invite people from APA to do, to be those uh, speakers. And then they have a swap and sale, which is different than Hamilton's print swap. This is a lot of like heavy equipment. Like if you've been searching for a furniture cab for forever, or you just want to buy a new type, old type, new old type, um, this is a good time. Like bring your, bring your tractor trailer and show up for the APA goose because you can get some treats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, again, thanks to all of you and especially HR for a great presentation and uh, a great job with the work. So uh, thanks again. And as Steph said, we'll put out the schedule of the next ones that we have. So uh, have a good weekend and thanks to all. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see faces again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.